Giles. I'm a member of the Politics and the Pub Committee and I'll be your chairperson for tonight's topic, which is where is the ALP left and what does it stand for? The timing is amazing. This keeps on happening for us in politics in the pub. The, the topic seems to coincide with some major public event. It's happened again because it comes in the same week as the celebration of Gough Whitlam's courageous life of magnificent achievements of progressive reforms that, as we all know, transformed Australia and is now under vicious attack by the Abbott government. Now we chose the topic on the ALP left because although there's been much media coverage for a few months about the needed reform of the ALP, there hasn't been really, there's been really insufficient detailed informed public opinion about the internal structures of the ALP that determine how its policy is formulated and how state and federal members and the leaders of parliaments are chosen. Now I think we all know that there are two main factions, right and left, and they have a key role both in the structure of the ALP and its functioning. Now as we are quite obviously a left progressive organisation, we've chosen two excellent speakers from the left, John Graham and Stephen Jones. Our second speaker is Stephen Jones and it's a slightly longer bio, but it's a fascinating bio. He was first elected to the Federal Parliament in 2010, representing the New South Wales Regional Electorate of Throsby, which is mainly down the Wollongong Illawarra area, where he was born and raised. He was elected, he was re-elected in 2013. In 2012, Stephen put forward a private member's bill to legalise same-sex marriage which is a big issue we did, what was it, only two, two weeks ago. The bill was defeated in the House of Reps. In 2013, he was appointed by Bill Shorten as the Shadow Parliamentary Secretary for Regional Development and Infrastructure, and in 2014, was appointed to the Shadow Ministry by Shorten as the Shadow Minister for Health, an issue that we have talked about lots and lots here. We might have some interesting questions or insights from Stephen about what's happening to Medicare. Mr Jones' shadow portfolio responsibilities also include regional health, indigenous health policy, as well as oversight over seven health regulatory agencies, therapeutic goods administration, food standards Australia New Zealand, and the National Blood Authority. He currently sat, serves on the standing committee on health, joint select committee on constitutional recognition of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders, people and the caucus committee, I suppose predictably, on social policy. He has a Bachelor of Arts degree from the University of Wollongong and a Bachelor of Laws from Macquarie. And he's worked in the community sector for various frontline disability services, health services and youth projects. Prior to entering federal par parliament, he worked as an industrial officer with the ACTU and as the secretary of the CPSU, which is the Community and Public Sector Union. So his experience has been extraordinarily broad and therefore gives him great weight and insight. Thanks, Wim. Thanks, John. No, I start by acknowledging country, uh, pay my respects to the Gadigal people of the Aura Nation, extend that respect to any Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander people who may be with us today. Uh, and I hope it doesn't diminish the sincerity of uh, that acknowledgement of him. The next breath, I'd like to uh, pay tribute to uh, the great Labor leader, Edward Gough Whitlam, who we sent off in such a fantastic fashion, a true celebration of Labor history at the Sydney Town Hall yesterday. There were many people in the room who were there, and I think uh, you'd all agree that uh, there was a moment uh, there where there was a sparkle in our eye and we were all very proud to be a part of this great Labor tradition. Uh, Wynne, thanks for the invitation and I extend that thanks to uh, the committee who've organised this great series. Last time I was here there was a racetrack over there. I'm not sure that's an improvement but anyway, that's progress in the inner city. Uh, we've been asked uh, to uh, answer the question where is the ALP left and what does it stand for? 
the temptation to respond to this cheeky question, <laughs> if not provocative question, with an equally cheeky and provocative answer is overwhelming. Uh, the Labor left uh, has been hiding in some pretty obvious places, as John said. Uh, which of you would think to be looking for lefties in the office of uh, the Premier of New South Wales, Victoria, Queensland, South Australia, Tasmania, uh, Western Australia? Would you never think to look for the left in the office of the Deputy Prime Minister, the Prime Minister, the Deputy Leader of the Opposition, two-fifths of the Shadow Executive, the former Leader of Government Business in the House, the current Leader of Opposition uh, Business in the Senate, you could add to that uh, the last three presidents and secretaries of the ACTU, numerous secretaries of trades and labour councils around the country, some of our leading trade union officials, as John has mentioned, and together with that, literally hundreds of union activists, community activists and Indigenous leaders around the country. The names uh, Joan Kerner, Carmen Lawrence, Anna Bly, Jay Wetherill, Anthony Albanese, Julie Gillard, Tanya Plevisic, Penny Wong, Jenny George, the list is necessarily a bridge, but I make the point of a lot of the people that we look to as either an example or for as uh, comradery are those upon uh, whom we display, uh, dispose uh, uh, icon status within the current left and those who we look on as uh, very proudly as our forebears. So I simply make this comment at the beginning of the discussion the Reds are not under the best. <laughs> Let me anticipate the next contention, and that is, quite properly, it's not enough to have good left people in positions of influence if you're not delivering good policy and good outcomes for the Australian people. Well, to that I offer school education reform and needs-based funding for our school system throughout the country the National Broadband Network, re-civilising the laws of our workplace in the last term of government, national shipping reform, equal pay for community workers, something that if uh, Sally was here she could tell us long uh, and in detail to, uh, about. The apology for the stolen generation, the uh, forced adoption uh, policies of previous generations, the establishment of a Royal Commission into institutional child abuse. The introduction of paid maternity leave and paternity leave, to that I'd add our record of investment on higher education, skills and infrastructure. Dealing with the global financial crisis, let us not forget when this country was last confronted with an economic uh, challenge of the phenomena that we were encountering between 2008 and 2009, the answer was to cut benefits, cut wages and cut government spending. In government, we took a different approach, give priority to jobs, keep businesses open. And to do that, we ensured that our banks were insured to stave off a credit crisis. We targeted stimulus spending towards the retail sector and then towards infrastructure and education. The objective, keep people in jobs. The National Disability Insurance Scheme funded in part by an increase to the Medicare levy. Friends, the conception and implementation of these ideas was not always perfect. But none of us, not even the most cynical amongst us, could seriously argue that Australia is not a better, not a fairer, not a more equal place because of the reforms of that Labor government. So I ask, what do you want from the Labor left? And comrades, I've got to say, if what you want is an Antipodean reincarnation of Euro-communism, press release, you are going to be disappointed. The mainstream left in Australia has always been, always been, of a more pragmatic bent. We have been influenced by the international thought, but we've always had a uniquely Australian approach. I argue that the consistent threat of socialist thought has been and will continue to be to rescue the human condition from the ravages of want. To liberate the mind and the body from economic and social disability so that we can all reach our full human capacity. That was Labor's mission at the turn of the last century. It remains our mission today. 
I want to say a few things about the importance of the mainstream and the centre in Australian politics. It's about moving the mainstream and it's about why Labor matters and why the Labor left matters. And to this I make the observation that government is the site around which political parties seek to influence and define the mainstream, the norm, the common sense of the country. It's where we try and make our own ideas, the ideas that Australians accept as their own and the natural way of being. Labor has always understood that to do this, you need to do more than to control the citadel. You need to have a strong popular movement, working through all of the organs of civil society, building the foundations of sustainable social change, progressive social change. Sadly, friends, if there was a lesson from the Whitlam government, if there's a lesson from the Rudd and Gillard governments, it's that so much of what we did through those great periods of reform were not in place long enough to take hold, which made it so much easier for a Conservative government to come along afterwards and undo all of the hard work. So shifting the ground is the principal task of the left. And in this place, Labor holds a very special place in our national story. I offer two contentions for debate tonight. The first is this, that the left, and Labor in particular, has given Australia its most enduring value. From the Labor movement of the 1800s sprung the very simple idea that a country as wealthy and prosperous as ours could offer a fair go for all. So powerful was the idea, so effective was Labor at organising around this idea, that it became a part of our mainstream. So much so that everyone today, from sports commentators to news editors, unionist and HR professionals, and every politician that has held office and tried to do something since the Second World War, has tra tried to plant their ideas for change, their propositions, in their very deep and fertile soil of the Aussie fair go. It was Labor that created this enduring Australian value and Labor that continues to plant its seeds in that very deep and fertile, fertile soil. The second proposition that I advance is this. The organisation of Australian society and Australian politics is such that if you want a sustainable progressive shift you have to get Australian Labor to adopt it. It's always been the way, friends. And can I say that even before there was a Labor left, it was those with a big vision that transcended the immediate that forced these changes. From suffragism to equal pay and family law reform to affirmative action. From land rights to the apology to the, the stolen generation and closing the gap. From the Stonewall riots to the gay Mardi Gras and anti-discrimination legislation. From the Franklin Dam to Daintree and action on climate change. From pension reform and the National Broadband Network. Friends, none of these reforms would have been popular. None of these reforms would have been possible without Labor. When Labor adopts an idea and commits itself to it and organises around it, that idea enters the political mainstream. It becomes popular. It becomes possible. The National Disability Insurance Scheme, the National Broadband Network, and as John has mentioned earlier today, the possibility of gay marriage. So what's the role of the Labor left in this? Well, it's the role of the left in general to redefine the middle ground. And the right in politics, not just in Australia, but throughout the world, understands this very well. The rise of the Tea Party in the United States is a perfect example of that. The right understands that to make their small government an individualist prescription, the natural order of things, they must shift the middle ground to their way of thinking. 
Friends, at our worst, Labor does nothing more than hold a mirror up to the world as we see it and say, that's what we think and that's what we do. The latest uh, incarnation of that, if you like, is focus groups and polling and having a focus group and polling driven, driven <coughs> policy. The left has got to be much more than that. The left understands that if we want to imagine a better society and organise around a better society and drive for a progressive reform, then we do need to do much more than hold focus groups and put all of our resources into phone polling. It's organising around ideas that matters. So if this is what you want Labor to be, you have to understand that politics is not a spectator sport. You have to join the team to make it happen. Now, of course, we have our weaknesses. The left is often better at whinging about something than doing something about it. And of course, the left doesn't always join the Labor Party. And often when they do, they're quick to leave when things don't go their way. And the problem with that is it vacates the field to all of others who don't share our views of the way the world should be organised. So we have a job to do, but there's a lot to be hopeful about. On the top of our agenda, as we prepare for our next term of federal Labor government, the left, the left needs to organise around the ideas for a future and progressive Australia. And if we dr dream of a better government and better services and better support for those who need it, then we have to organise around the ideas about how we fund it. Necessarily, that means a shift in the debate around debt and deficit and taxation. We need to keep the hope around alive around realistic action to address our generational challenge, and that is the challenge of climate change. We need to keep Medicare alive so that a future government can improve and expand on it. An improvement in the area of dental care stands out alone as an ideal area that should be one that we develop policy around. Education reform from preschool to university, an agenda for true equity and quality from beginning to end. Indigenous recognition as the next necessary step, recognising the first Australians in our founding document as the next necessary step in, rec in reconciliation with the first Australians. Marriage equality, as I've already spoken about, I believe the politicians are behind the common sense of the Australian people on this issue. It's Labor's opportunity when we are next in government to ensure that we catch up. Republic and building out the, nation, the notion of Australian citizenship are two other areas that I earmark as important areas for progressive Labor reform. As we fight to realise this, and as a left, as we fight to shift the centre and to move the country, I need you to understand this. Australia can't do it without Labor, and Labor can't do it without you. Thank you very much.